The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So, I first want to acknowledge my co-authors, Hamzi Hajlu, who did a lot of the work especially for the presentation here and putting it together, and my colleagues at the National Research Council, Nardine Benishu and Mohammed Sultan, who have been involved with some of the test results that are uh, presenting. Just about the fire hazard introduction, so we need to know about fire safety, particularly for buildings. Also a concern for bridges, although that's not the focus of this talk. But my emphasis is on the fiber-reinforced polymers, so we have high strength fibers that are in a polymer matrix. Certainly the polymer itself is very susceptible to higher temperatures than concrete and steel. And so hence we particularly have to understand what's going on with these materials. So the reason I titled the talk intentionally towards what we might use and in some ways even reaching further than what Luke was talking about for concrete buildings where we've had a lot of experience with fires, etc. And now we're talking about a new and different material and how so the unknowns are even greater. But some of the same issues abound as Luke had mentioned. And the ones that I thought I'd talk a little bit about are the fire intensity, which Luke has already covered, so just thermal modeling. And the loads in a fire, Luke's talked a little bit about what you do for loading or, or mention that, but there are particular issues with regard to FRP and how it's designed compared to how steel reinforced concrete is, and then about configuration of reinforcement and things like that, particular to FRP that may not apply for a steel reinforced concrete. So this is a similar picture to what Luke showed about showing the, a realistic fire and then the curve that is often sort of used the standard fire curve and test, etc. Luke talked quite a bit about that. I won't spend much more time about that. But then sort of the next step, I mean, one, if you sort of define your fire, then you want to model, well, what's the effect of exposing your concrete structure to that fire? And once again, here is just looking at the member, not looking at the overall structure yet. And I think certainly for, Luke's mentioned the challenges for reinforced concrete in general, but for FRP, we've got the new material, et cetera. I think I'm just sticking at the moment to the member base. So this just shows, okay, we can generally get the, this is the furnace, the standard fire curve. So if you expose this, this is a numerical model. And it shows that if you have a numerical model shown by the dash, and these are different depths through, and this is actually test results on FRP reinforced slabs. You can see that we can predict the temperatures with reasonable accuracy. And so that doesn't seem to be too much of a problem. Caveat is, as Luke mentioned as well, what about spalling, et cetera? We'll set that aside. So this assumes no spalling or anything. We didn't get it in these tests. But once again, I quite carefully made certain that we had a lower strength concrete mix and the contractor didn't add more <laughs> cement, et cetera, early on. So then we come to sort of, well, what loads to use? The standards that are used, it says, well, look at the strength of your member and then associate the test load based upon that and basically apply generally a full service load. This is a case where we have 60 millimeters clear concrete cover, which is the Canadian standard for FRP reinforcement is suggested that that's what you would need for a two-hour fire rating for FRP. One of the things we calculated here, the moment of resistance, we got 84. And then what we would back out is we would probably get from that strength, we would estimate that we probably should apply something in the order of 60 kilonewton meters to that. However, what we did in our tasks was we applied 45 kilonewton meters, which is 33 kip feet. The reason for that has to do with the expected sort of service moment. So you see what we're designing for this, that our actual service load is much, much lower than this, and actually sort of technically below the cracking load. 
So what happens in FRP reinforced compared to steel reinforced is that your design is governed much more by serviceability requirements, both deflections and crack control. So this graph shows this. So these are sort of, when you're doing the design, the calculations. So you can see here that this is our dead load that we designed the slab for, and then the service load is here just to under cracking. This is the load that we applied in the fire test. And you can see these are the deflections that we're getting at that level from two predictions, ACI and it's not the terrorist organization. It used to be a Canadian organization looking at research in uh, FRP. Anyway, I digress. But we look at our deflection is about 10 millimeters, like about half an inch. That's sort of the maximum for the span here, about four meters that we're looking at that's allowable deflection under live loads, LN over 360. And in this case, we can see that we're getting total deflections here of estimating of sort of double that. And sort of the live load increment, if we look over here, and this just shows the increase due to the superimposed load, doesn't account for the dead load deflections. So if we were to get at that limit, we would be saying, well, really, from a deflection perspective, the load should only be in the order of 20 kilonewton meters, the additional uh, load that's applied. And we applied basically 35 more in this test. But if we went by strength alone, we'd be saying to be going way up here, which is just completely unrealistic in terms of deflections and how that would ever be designed in practice. So we did do that. We applied it. With this, we actually got, according to the standard fire, over three hours of fire endurance. And one of the things we did here, this was, as Luke said, just simply supported, it's not realistic of a frame or anything, but we also, the supports, we only had about eight inches that, at the supports that was not exposed to the fire. And we still got this three hour sort of resistance. So then we tried it with 40 millimeters clear cover, so that's basically about an inch and a half. We actually got a little more strength in this design. We applied the same moment in fire and sort of deflections were a little bit lower in this case. Once again, we actually got three hours of fire endurance even in this scenario. I didn't think we'd even get the two hours in this case. But one of the things that we did is we know that the issues relate to the bond because we know that the bond of the FRP to the concrete is dependent upon that polymer. And the polymer is what is affected quite readily by the high temperature. So this is sort of in those eight inches at the end, and we're sort of looking at the temperatures there. So this little portion, these sort of eight inches at the end, not exposed to the fire. And so we have much lower temperatures during the fire exposure you see here. We're only getting up to about 100 degrees centigrade. That's the boiling point of water, so 212 Fahrenheit, and slightly higher in these regions here as we're moving a little bit closer to the fire. So what does that mean for the bond strength? So we've done material tests on it. So this shows our high temperature furnace to look at this. And we did some pull-out specimens to see. And you can see, well, quite quickly we get drop off of bond strength. And certainly at the 100 degrees Celsius, 200 Fahrenheit, we've lost considerable amount of bond strength. But there still always seems to be a little bit of bond strength. So perhaps you, if you have longer anchorage, works better. Here, we had eight inches or, or less, and it was still enough to hold the loads. These are some of the failure modes that we got when we did these tests on the material testing. So they're largely dependent upon the polymer. And so when we actually looked at what happened when the slabs actually did fail, it was actually due to the bond at the end. So we could actually see some slip here of bars, and that's what precipitated the failure, but that was after the three hours of the fire exposure. So the other thing to think about in terms of this, we know that we were overloaded in terms of deflections for these beams, but another important thing for these slabs is to sort of understand, well, what were the stresses in the bars? And so here we actually had, in the first test, the bars had on average about 160 MPA, which is about 23 KSI, and the strain was about 2,600 microstrain. The second test a little higher. For glass FRP bars that we were using in this case, 
the limits for design sort of say that their sustained stress should be in this. So we're sort of in that sort of region for the stress limits. And to satisfy crack control, also typically say from a strain limit, about 2,000 microstrain is expected. Although the stresses are low and much, much lower than the ultimate capacity of the bars, they are still typical of those stresses that you're typically to encounter in a GFRP, reinforced concrete design. However, it's useful to understand the context of the tests that if you do have a situation where you have much higher stresses and much higher bond stresses, you may not get the same performance. But this is very representative of most practice. So some of the conclusions and sort of future directions mentioned about the uh, realistic fires and that should include the cooling phase, as Luke had mentioned. Certainly for FRP reinforced, I think it's just practical just to focus for the time being on the standard fire and sort of understanding how we can predict performance with that. But then in longer term, we could look at that Europe code approach. Thermal modeling is fairly reasonable as long as things don't spall. And then as Luke identified, then there's so many factors and what to do there. Issues about the realistic loads for FRP reinforced. I think that certainly if you're doing analysis, so if you're trying to predict it from a modeling perspective, you will know what your expected loads should be and you won't be too worried about, well, you have extra strength capacity. And so that's probably not too bad from a design perspective, but the test approaches the ASTM E119 would have said we would have had to put much, much higher load on than we did. And that just would have been nonsensical. We already had, you know, an inch and a half in a 15-foot span of deflection, and you'd be talking about three inches deflection or something like that. It's just completely ridiculous. So if we're looking at FRP reinforced concrete, we need to figure out, well, what's a way in which we should test these things? And of course, we need to understand about anchorage and stress levels. We need to be able to model the anchorage appropriately or develop design requirements so that we know we have adequate anchorage, not only at room temperature, but in a fire scenario. Just to acknowledge uh, funders and partners, and I would be happy to answer any questions.